Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to TAG's Prop 2 Breakdown uh, with Chairman uh, Terry Canales. Uh, the chairman is actually running a few minutes behind, um, and so we are joined by uh, the committee clerk, his committee clerk, Dylan Matthews, uh, the committee clerk for House, the House Transportation Committee. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and the chairman's going to join us momentarily because um, I want to make sure that we uh, make the most of everyone's time this morning. So let's get started. As, as we've done this before, if you can uh, please send your questions at, throughout the program um, in the chat box directly to me, um, there will be a, a portion of the program where we do take a Q&A. Um, I want to, again, commend everybody that's joining us this morning. Uh, clearly, you are here to learn more about Proposition 2, uh, which is on the ballot on November 2nd. Um, this proposition is formerly known as HJR 99. Many of you might remember that TAG was an ardent and early supporter of this legislation that um, House Transportation Chairman um, spearheaded. And so we're here today to learn a little bit more about the proposition, what it really means for us here locally, and what we need all of you to do uh, to get the word out to make sure that we get this proposition passed um, in November. I would also like to remind everybody that early voting does start uh, this Monday, October 18th. There's not a lot of other things on the ballot um, this November that are large ticket items. And so it's really important um, that we show up uh, in support of this proposition as much as possible. Um, so Chairman Canales is actually running a few minutes behind this morning. Um, as you can imagine, he's a bit busy. <laughs> so, uh, but, as I, but as I mentioned, uh, we are joined today by his committee clerk, Dylan Matthews, who I can personally tell you um, knows the legislation and the proposition issues um, just as well. And so we're delighted to have him here um, to talk a little bit about the history of um, this initiative and kind of where we are today. And then, as I mentioned, Chairman Canales will join us for the Q&A portion. So without further ado, um, I want to welcome Dylan. And uh, Dylan, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good to be with you. and, and uh, Chairman Canales is caught up in a few uh, a few things this morning. I don't know if you, saw, you guys saw the House floor calendar for today, uh, but I believe there's 90 amendments on from one of the bills, and so they're uh, they're having to go through a whole lot right now. <laughs> so, um, so I'm let me take it from uh, this. This is let me take it from from this angle first. Um, like Andrea said, HR 99 uh, it was a constitutional amendment that we. Um, that we filed, and early on we filed it and had discussions with uh, Chairman Nichols, who um, almost immediately latched on and said, "This is, a, you know, this is let's let's see how this goes. This, this is a good idea." And even early on, I remember talking to 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 y'all about how um, how important this is for local communities. What caused this, and you know, we you know, what caused us to to file this constitutional amendment was not only learning about it last interim. So surprisingly, some people, you know, some folks think that the interim is kind of a waste of time and, and we don't really do much, but we actually do study some stuff. And even through COVID, we were looking at different things we could do to help transportation finance. One of the biggest things we realized is that transportation finance is really struggling and no one really talks about it. And 
some of the ideas came through. We had one for a Texas Mobility Fund, which we, we made some progress on that. We opened that up partially. Um, and then HDR 99 came down the pipeline as, as one of the top priorities after discussing with all the experts, you guys, basically. Um, and then to really you know, put the cherry on top, the American Council of Engineering Companies released a report in October 2020. And shout out to Scott Stewart, who I see on, on the Zoom here. Um, so October 2020, that report came out and it showed that Texas is underfunding transportation infrastructure by approximately $7.2 billion every single year. And when you start, look, you start looking at that data and you, you'll see that year after year, that number is growing. And you know, this isn't, these aren't our numbers. These are numbers from the, the engineers. These, these, are, these are the experts. And between 2019 and 2030, we're just gonna see an underinvestment in transportation by $111 billion. So we gotta do something. I mean, that's, and, and this, these solutions take a long time to really implement. You know, we should be, we should have been, uh, in my opinion, we should have been preparing for transportation infrastructure 20, 30 years ago, uh, but the finances were not caught up. Um, so uh, another, another startling uh, reality we, we recognize is as redistricting was moving about, the, the murmurs were going throughout the legislature. Um, we learned that by 2050, the Texas population is going to be almost doubling. And I'll, I'll, I'll read some recent stats from Chairman Bug. He said that the Houston TxDOT district right now, which is a little bit more than Harris County, uh, it's some surrounding counties, if I'm not mistaken, that TxDOT district has 6.9 million people right now. And by 2050, it's going to be 13 million. So almost, an, so it's an 88% increase in population. Um, and, and looking back a little bit, Prop 1 and Prop 7 were extraordinary tools. I, you know, I, Chairman Canal has tips his hat to Chairman Nichols for uh, laying that framework and pushing those, those initiatives. Hugely important, you know, we've learned on the transportation finance scale. Ultimately, we, we've realized that it didn't solve all the problems. It significantly helped, but it, the problems are still there. There's really no interest in raising gas taxes. There's no interest in indexing a gas tax, which hasn't been indexed or, or raised since 1991. Um, and since 1991, the gas tax has lost half of its purchasing power due to the inflation of the construction cost of building a highway. There are, and on top of that, toll roads are, are not popular. So there's this, there's this idea that you can have three things. You either have congestion, or you have toll roads, or you have increased taxes. We can't increase gas tax. Toll roads are off the table. So congestion is really our only, you know, what we're seeing here, one of our few options. HDR 99 is, I think, potentially an exception to that, that, that statement. HDR 99, which is, of course, Prop 2, does not raise taxes. It does not raise fees. It is an innovative tool that's been around at, you know, I, I've been, I looked in the tax increment financing, which has been uh, prior to filing this, and I think it's been around since the 50s and 60s. It's been a tool that somewhere out in the country folks have utilized. So it's not new. Cities are currently using it. Um, and, and we think this is a great tool without really having a lot of impact on folks' you know, home budgets, their personal budgets, their, their wallets. So. Can you, um, Dylan, thank you for that overview. Can you go back and talk a little bit about, this was on the ballot, I think back in 2011. Um, I don't remember the prop number, but um, can you share, I know Chairman Canales has talked about if this doesn't pass this November, that the chances of us being able to bring it back again are pretty pretty slim. So can you, can you talk about kind of the history of, of why that didn't pass? Yeah, well, so there's, there's some speculation on this, but one of them is, I think the primary reason why it did not pass is the confusing ballot language. The ballot language hinted at the idea that this was a tax increase. And it kind of, it, it just didn't, it didn't make a clear case that this was not a tax increase. 
And I don't have the ballot language in front of me, but we struggled with that right when we filed this bill. We realized we got to get the ballot language right, but we, obviously we're not going to misrepresent it by any means. But but we want to make sure it reflects what's actually happening because what happened in the past is what ultimately killed it. Um, yeah, the the language was really confusing on the ballot, and I looked at it recently, and I just thought uh, it. I was scratching my head on why they worded it that way. You know, it's just it's just it is what it is. Session is really wild, and some you know some of the smaller details get missed out. Um, but the reality is, in 2011, which is now 10 years ago, we had a bite at this this uh, this apple. We in some capacity, right. and we could. It, it took us 10 years to reapproach the issue. And we reapproached, re, re, excuse me, reapproached re it because the folks from the, our cities and our counties need more opportunities to build out infrastructure. And I'll tell you one more thing on top of this. Prop two is is not only about building roads and highways. Mm -hmm. It can build a whole lot more. It can build bike lanes. It can build rail lines, passenger freight, transit, uh, the transit infrastructure. You name a transportation infrastructure alternative uh, other than roads and highways, and I'm almost certain that this can be used to build that. And with the exception is, of toll roads. <laughs> oh, pardon? I said with the exception of toll roads. <laughs> except toll roads. Except toll yeah. roads. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Yeah. So that's that's. Yeah. The 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 flexibility is is what's really important, and the the, the real kicker here for me is too is that. This is optional. No county is being forced to do this. Right. If, you know, these counties are elected officials. They can they can decide if they, hey, we don't want to we don't want to try this. Let's not try it. It's not what you know. Maybe our folks don't want to do it. But in our urban areas where we're seeing massive congestion levels, mass, you know, we they want alternatives for bikes and pedestrian uh, walkways. This is a tool. I mean, it's just a simple tool that folks can use. So. So um, thank you, Dylan. Uh, I, my conversation, I, I did have a conversation with the Chronicle yesterday, and it was a very, very pointed question of, you know, what, what makes this unique and what makes this different than kind of other funding mechanisms. And my comment was, and to piggyback on what you've said, is that it's, it, it allows counties to really tailor the funding to the transportation needs for that particular county, um, which is pretty unique. It's not subject to kind of a statewide formula of how, you know, how the funds need to be used. It can be tailored. So if it's roads, you know, uh, bike lanes, at bike lanes, um, it, it really, it helps it feel more of like a local um, option, quite frankly, than a, kind of a, a state mandated option. Um, I know that our chairman, tag chairman, uh, Mustafa Tamiz has a question. So I'm going to tip it to him. Dylan, first, uh, thank you again for, for being here today and, and all the work that you do. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people on the call that are really deep subject matter experts on this, right? Like, you know, very good men and others that, that can teach courses on this. But then we have a lot of other people that are trying to understand this and get their arms around it. And it's going to be important for them to know this because not only we have to pass this, but then we have to work, you know, across the state, getting people to understand it at county level to take advantage of it, right? You talk a little bit about, um, you know, comparing it to TERS and what municipalities do. Can you drill down a little bit and explain how counties will be able to use this? Andrea started to talk a little bit about it, but drill down a, one or two more steps down on this. Yeah. So, so let me just clarify with your question. So you, uh, so how we can. How, how cities can you implement this? Like how, examples of how or? or... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you you had made a comparison that this has been around for a long time in terms of TERS, right? Uh, cities have been able to create TERS and been able to take advantage of, of that. You were using that as an example. Uh, go a little bit further and, and talk about it in, in, in context of what people already understand and how this is not that, you know, this is something that we've done before in different ways. Yeah, right, right. Um, so, so as, as you said, there's a lot of experts on this matter here, um, but essentially transportation reinvestment zone is, it's a zone created by, it would be a zone created by the county. It'd be, a, um, and you could, you could create a geographic region. You end up tying, or you, you end up pledging tax 
incre the property tax increment that is a product of the infrastructure. So the, as you know, as you build out infrastructure, you have businesses that could potentially be popping up. You have business opportunities, you have business growth, you have housing, you have all sorts of great things that come around businesses, uh, excuse me, infrastructure. So as you know, the reason there is that property tax increase is because we are building that infrastructure. So the growth created by the infrastructure is being used to put back into the infrastructure. Whether, you know, and, and folks, folks want bike lanes, folks want roads, they want highways, they want, to, they want to relieve the congestion around them. I have a 30 minute commute for, for, to get back and forth from work. I don't think it'll get uh, that much better unless we expand the highway. But if we, we're short on money where we're spending, you know, about $5 billion down through central Austin uh, for I-35, a TRZ could be used to help fund that so we can put uh, that, that extra money and say, you know, let's say we were able to leverage uh, several hundred million dollars. We can put that several hundred million dollars that we would have spent into other regions of Texas. So uh, long quarters, for instance, like I said, I-35 through Austin. And I see that the chairman just popped in. I-35 through Austin, there are businesses impacted all along that stretch. If we were to capture just a slight percentage of that property tax increase from the from the, the renovation of I-35, who knows how much money we could potentially grab from that to pay for 35 to relieve other infrastructure projects around the region. So thank you. Thank you. So it's, it's in essence, you're tying that money to that region to do further improvements right in that locality. And, and that's the and that's the kind of advantage that this could be, especially at a county level where you have precincts. So if you're trying to do development around the port of Houston, for example, you where you really need better roads, that that's that's accomplishable if the, if this is passed. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Darren. Uh, <laughs> Darren says he also has an exhibit if needed. You are right. There are lots of experts on this call. Uh, but his comment is the big difference between a TIR, a TERS, TIRZ, and a TRZ, which is what we're talking about with Prop 2, is that the TRZ boundary follows a transportation facility. So um, that's kind of the guiding principle for that. And he says he has an exhibit if needed. <laughs> so um, we do have, have lots of uh, subject matter experts on the, on the call. So I did not see the chairman come in, Dylan. Um, is he coming in under a different name? Oh, he's in. A, yeah, I see him right now. He's, uh, oh, you can see him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Chairman. Ah, there we are. I apologize. I didn't see you. No um, worries. Good morning. So, good morning. We appreciate you making some time for us this morning. We know you're very busy. Um, Dylan said a great job, kind of kicking us off with just the rundown, a little bit of the history um, of. HDR 99 and, and and Prop 2 and how it was previously on the ballot. Um, I would like for you um, to talk about just all the work that you've been doing with Chairman Nichols to get the word out. And what do you see as kind of the biggest challenge that we're facing um, to get this past uh, November 2nd? Good morning, Andrea. Thank you for having me. Um, it's I'm excited about Prop 2. So I'll share with you some of the updates from our end. Senator Nichols and I have been doing interviews with several editorial boards uh, about Prop 2. We've interviewed with the Austin American Statesman, Fort Worth Telegram, the San Antonio Express, Houston Chronicle. And next week during early voting, we're going to also have our op-ed submitted to dozens of newspapers and outlets around the state. Uh, so you can keep an eye out for that. I know everyone here knows about Prop 2, but I'll give you my quick rundown. Uh, it's probably one of the most innovative ways to fund transportation. Um, Texas is growing at about a thousand people uh, per day. That's births and migration, uh, and they're not bringing their roads with them. So um, our congestion levels right now, as many people know that live in, in the metro areas, uh, are abysmal. Um, and the rural cities, uh, they're experiencing unprecedented growth as well. And so it's only getting worse. Um, Texas population is scheduled to double by 2050. Uh, and major cities like Austin, um, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, Fort Worth, um, well, they're going to see the largest population growth. The Austin Textile District, uh, by the way, has a has two point roughly two point one million people right now, um, and by twenty fifty, that's projected to be at around four point four million. That's a hundred and ten percent increase. 
Um, the Houston Textile District uh, is at 6.9, and by 2050, it will be at 13 million. That's an 88% projected increase. And so if you can imagine what Houston and Austin roads would look like in 30 years with twice the amount of traffic, uh, it would be um, unmanageable. Uh, so the reality is if Texas doesn't start prioritizing transportation infrastructure right now, the, our children uh, will not be prepared for the congested future, but our economy will be stifled. Um, the, and I've referenced this, and those of you keep up with the legislature uh, have probably heard me say this, but um, the American Council of Engineering Companies published a report that showed that Texas is underfunding transportation infrastructure by about $7.2 billion. Underfunding uh, can be interpreted by many different people in many different ways, but I believe the way that the council uh, approached it is the accurate way. And so if I'm right, and I believe, and the Council of Engineering is right, um, I believe the numbers show that between 2019 uh, and 2030, we will have underinvested in our transportation infrastructure by about 111 billion. So this is a serious problem. It's got to change. Um, in the House of Representatives, the legislature in general understands uh, that this is important because if you look at what we had, it wasn't a polarizing issue. Um, the House, we had 111 co-authors, but moreover, 127 yes votes, which is really impressive. That's a, I call it the super duper majority in the House. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so uh, the question is, why did so many members vote for this? Uh, if you look in the Senate, it was 27 yes votes of 31. Well, they know the reality of transportation infrastructure in Texas. Um, they know that we've got one of the greatest systems in the world, but they also know we're in a dark place when it comes to the projections uh, and what we're and what the current climate is for funding transportation. So the legislature realizes this is a solution. Uh, one of these solutions. It is not the solution, but it is a tool in the toolbox to build projects, um, not only around the state, but in particular, what I what is my favorite part um, and, and used to be a principle of the legislature is local control. So the local communities get to decide what projects uh, they're going to fund through Prop 2 if it's passed. We're already doing this with cities. Um, so It'll allow these local people to use that tax increment financing um, and grow not only some areas that have no, no investment or, or no infrastructure, but also improve those areas that do. Um, it's an economic development tool is, is in addition. So one of the things that I also think is important that people need to know is that cities, as I've mentioned, cities are already doing this, but cities and counties can double up and pay for a project twice as fast. And so... Uh, and then and then realize then those entities get to realize that tax increase later in their coffers. Um, and I say it's not ta tax increase, but tax revenue. So there's a bunch of people that are out there, uh, including, uh, you know, turf and, and, and um, you know, people like Terry Hall that's opposed to every single thing uh, that came through my entire committee all session. Is, is that she says it's a tax increase. That is not true. Well, when you invest in something, I, call, I don't know if um, people, and when I was a kid, there was a movie called Field of Dreams. If you build it, it will come. And when you build infrastructure, people gravitate to it. People want to be close to um, thoroughfares, their businesses. Uh, people want to be close. To, it's, it's a quality of life, being able to move. And so when you do that, the property value increases. It's not a tax increase. The, the rate of taxes does not ever increase. Well, it, I mean, it could, but what I'm saying is this is not, not, as a, uh, not by virtue of this. And so what you're capturing is the value that, of the land that goes up. And so, and only for a limited amount of time to pay for the project. And so um, I would tell you, zooming in a bit, uh, Prop 1 and Prop 7, who uh, were largely orchestrated by Senator Nichols, Chairman Nichols, uh, were extraordinary creations. Um, they provided billions in revenue, um, but Prop 1's volatile. Uh, the revenue, uh, you we've watched um, oil and gas dip into negative numbers, and that's concerning. And so Prop 7's pretty dependable, uh, giving us a reliable $2.5 billion a year. The only problem is that Prop 1 and 7 don't solve the entire problem. And so we're forced to start looking for other ways to finance this financial deficit or funding deficit that we're working with. So we're working against immense population increase, highway construction cost inflation, 
um, more fuel efficient vehicles, which has declining revenue stream when it comes to the gas tax. And so in a slew of other factors, uh, when you take that into account it, it collectively, we're, I hate to say it, but we're in a dark place uh, because it's only going to get um, quickly worse. And so we need a steady increase in transportation dollars to stay up with infrastructure. Uh, and Prop 2 isn't a, doesn't solve every one of our problems, but it's definitely a tool in the toolbox. So I know that when I'm talking to you guys, I'm preaching to the choir, <laughs> um, but I would ask you to get your friends and family to go out and vote for Prop 2. Everybody has a large stake. Um, what I will tell you is uh, one of the things that most everybody on this call probably knows is 97% constitutionally we're dedicated to roads uh, when it comes to transportation funding. And Prop 2 allows for, for projects outside the scope of roads, which is also extremely important, including rail, light rail, metro, um, you know, bike trails and things of that nature, which again goes back to local control and allowing our communities to decide what we're going to do, not by, and it's not raising taxes, doesn't raise fees, and it's just another option. And what we need in Texas are options. So there's not enough funding for transportation. Uh, there's not enough solutions out there for non-highway transportation alternatives. And we know we cannot pave our way out of our future problems. So um, once again, thank you for having me. Please, please uh, get your friends, your neighbors, uh, even call your enemies. Ask them to vote for Prop 2. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I did see that we have um, your uh, vice chairman on. Um, I, I, at first, it said Molly Wilson, so I was I was confused. But I know that that's, <laughs> that's your chief staff. So welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, Representative Thompson, thank you for joining us this morning. I, I wanted to see if you could kind of add to Chairman Canales' um, uh, comments to see kind of what you're hearing um, locally um, as far as questions that, that constituents are having or just from your vantage point in your lens, uh, what's helpful for us to know and understand. Sure, thank you all. Uh, yeah, I, I echo what the chairman uh, has said. And, you know, we're, we're in a situation where it is a funding issue and uh, no one likes to talk about that. I, I know uh, the chairman had another bill, which uh, was a, a study bill. And I'm sorry, I don't have that information in front of me, but uh, um, it, it was to study, you know, uh, the usage of roads by, by, by different, uh, and, and I think that's gonna be very, very important to be able to see, I, I mean, we talk a lot about that, you know, we talk about a lot about the, you know, but but being able to see that in a study that, that's going to be able to be put out there, I think is really going to help us with possibly going forward, uh, maybe looking at some some ways to uh, uh, to, to put the, the tax, if you will, uh, the you know, the highway funding on those that are really using the, the roads and, and, and the ones that are uh, are responsible for that. So I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that information. I think that was a, a, a very good piece of legislation. That I don't think, you know, he talked about, uh, I'll, I'll let him, he can, he can certainly fill you in a little bit more on that than I can, but uh, uh, I, I was excited to see that. And, and again, go, going back to your, your question, I mean, constantly we get asked about, you know, roads and I mean, there's not a, day goes by that I don't have someone reach out to me about uh, you know, issues on expanding the roads. Why can't this happen? Why can't that happen? Why don't we finish this? It's, it's ongoing. You know, we talk about the Grand Parkway in the Houston area. Uh, very, very frustrating to me that, that you know, we can't get, uh, you know, things moving on that. Uh, you know, we still have other issues uh, that we could, that we, I think, need to be addressed. Uh, so it's going to be a, it's, it's, it's going to be a long, long discussion about it. And, and it's, but we're going to have to keep, we're going to have to keep the pressure on. We're going to have to keep talking about it. And, and going to toll roads, I, you know, I think everybody on this call probably knows that, and the chairman alluded to this a little earlier about local control. Um, you know, there are areas of Texas that are not adverse to toll roads. And I think the Houston area, uh, Houston metropolitan area has shown that they're not adverse to, to toll roads, um, you know, that they're willing to, uh, uh, to use them and they, they, they use them 
there's a lot of use in the Houston area for tolls. So I, I think you have to look at this too, and from a regional standpoint, uh, and, and we can't just say we're opposed to a particular type of transportation uh, statewide because it might it might not work in you know in in far Texas, but it you know it works in Pearland, Texas. So that's the that's I think approach that that we need to start having that conversation around, and I wish we could I wish we could do that a little bit more up here rather than it becoming this uh, broad brush sometimes that we that we have to you know have to do. So so anyway, just okay. thank y'all for having me too. I, I always appreciate uh, uh, y'all and appreciate your advocacy. Um, you know, sometimes uh, a lot of people talk about transportation. But that's just it. They don't. They don't do much about it. You know. They just talk about it. So. So thank y'all for what y'all do. Thank you so much, Representative Thompson. Um, to kind of to follow up on that, I know we've got um, Alan Clark has a, a question um, talking about kind of okay. So if passed, what does this look like as as far as implementation? So Alan, are you still on? Can you unmute? Thank you. Yes, I am. And first of all, let me say thank you. This is a fantastic idea, and I think it's going to be a great tool in the toolbox for local governments to use. My, my question um, was about uh, the zone uh, that is created. Is it based upon um, a distance from the facility, and is that embodied in the legislation? Is that determined locally? And just wondered if you could comment on that. But thank you very much. This is a wonderful idea. Years ago, we looked at it for some quarter improvements. We're so disappointed that counties could not be participants in this. This, well, I think, will be um, really warmly embraced when people understand it. So thank you. Uh, what I what I think, um, and I'll let Dylan weigh in on it. Nevertheless, you have to have a project within the boundaries of this. Uh, and, the, and the scope of the boundaries are going to be similar to that that's laid out uh, when a city um, has used the tool before. But um, but I believe, Dylan, do you want to weigh in on it? Yeah, the, the, I'll, I'll just say real quick is that the the zone is uh, is created by the county, of course, and, and the zone can be whatever size that the county determines is necessary to apply, you know, whatever they decide. They have some flexibility in there to create. So. Uh, I'll just add that point. Thank you. I, I do want to, to visit on, if you uh, allow me, Andrea, on uh, what Mr. Thompson said, just for the sake of having a transportation conversation quickly, is it, that's a question that we continue get to get from um, every time we've done one of these editorial boards is, um, well, with that big a funding gap, how are you going to solve the future of Texas? And I just, what my opinion is, is that uh, when you look at the funding for transportation, the great majority of that 97% constitutionally dedicated money uh, grows to the preservation and maintenance of the 200,000 lane miles that exist in Texas. The preservation and maintenance is what chews up most of the budget. And so when you consider that, what is preservation and maintenance? Well, the reality is that uh, it's consumption of pavement for the most part. And so when you talk about consumption of pavement, that's what the study that uh, Chairman Thompson talked about was we have a, a study that's going to tell us exactly who, the who, what, where's, and when's of how this, our maintenance and preservation uh, is, how we're going to follow up. And what, one thing we know is that 18 wheelers and big rigs, commercial vehicles chew up the road at about 10,000 times the rate of a regular passenger vehicle. And so what we also know is that we do not collect that amount of money. And so this isn't an attack on trucking because trucking, that'll be a pass through, don't pass it to the customers. It's actually, Actually, a reality check for the rest of us is that our apples should cost more. The ladder that they delivered to Home Depot should cost more. And and because Texas is subsidizing all of us. We're like that 23-year-old kid that never moved out of their, their parents' house. Texas is still paying for us. And so the reality is until we start paying for ourselves and funding transportation because we can, um, we're always going to operate a deficit. And so when you talk about how to do that, well, you have to do vehicle miles traveled or lane miles traveled. Well, then everybody talks about the conspiracy theory and the black helicopters and Uncle Sam and Big Brother is going to watch what I'm doing. Well, the Supreme Court for many years says there's no constitutional uh, right uh, or expectation of privacy in commercial 
uh, activity. And so in commercial activity, um, when you're talking about on the highway, there's really nothing that should be hidden. And so I believe that Texas needs to start moving towards um, vehicle lane miles travel for commercial rigs, big rigs. And I think it's something that my colleagues on the far right should should embrace because um, most of those most of those trucks come from south of the border, out tens of thousands, and that's border security. We'll know where they're at to begin with. So when we're looking for people that are moving drugs and we're looking for people that are moving people or human trafficking, we'll also have an idea of where these people are at to begin with for law enforcement as well. And so I believe that no matter what, if we're going to start to catch up on funding in Texas, uh, we need to prop two and we need to go to vehicle lane miles travel at first, no doubt, for commercial vehicles, which are the largest consumers of the pavement, which is tantamount to the largest consumers of our budget. Thank you for that. Um, I know we've got another question, a great question from Karen Marshall. Karen, are you still on? Hi, I am on. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, the question I had was, would the funding source compete with the existing or the traditional TIRZs? No, no. So so the, this, the capture that uh, a city does are from the values that they raise. Um, and so in a county can actually, and the source where county derives their money is, a, is an entire different, I guess, um, piece of the pie, so to speak, when it comes to property taxes. And so what I mentioned earlier was the beauty of Prop 2 is it allows them to work in conjunction with one another and pay it off twice as fast. So if the city's using their tax in, uh, um, incremental tax value and the county's using theirs, um, they can pay off a project twice as fast and then realize that value later to their coffers. And so I, the, in short, the answer is no. Uh, and in fact, the, and because it's a no, it's a, it's a win-win for both cities and counties. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Also, I wanted to share uh, Chairman Canales and Representative Thompson. Um, TAG is, is looking to host a kind of a deep dive to have some of the attorneys from LawCorp too, to kind of walk through some of this with um, local officials that have to make this decision. So when it gets to uh, the county level, this passes, they're looking at doing this, the commissioner's court, it needs two thirds vote um, to pass the, the local court. So Chairman Canales, to your point, this is not a mandate, right? This is another tool in the toolbox. And I think that's very important for people to understand. So anything you want to elaborate on that, but that's my understanding is that, um, again, it can sit there forever and the county never utilizes it. We wouldn't want that, but it's by no means a mandate. Absolutely. That's the beauty of this as well. We're not mandating anything. We're giving people an option and options are good. You know, and so um, I'll tell you that there's nothing that mandates the use of it at all. And it's there, they can turn the switch on when they want it, they can turn it off when they don't. And so uh, it's very versatile, the tool. And, and that's, like I said, the versatility of Prop 2 is what makes it so attractive. Um, so I wanna have Barry Goodman, I know he's on and he was part of our early and ardent efforts. Um, and I know, he and Dylan would go back and forth quite a bit. So Barry, you are, in my mind, uh, our local subject matter expert on this. And so can you talk a little bit about your lens, through your lens and, and how this can be applied with kind of the local needs that we have here in the Houston region and why you're excited about this? Yeah, I'm particularly excited about this because um, it does give another tool in the toolbox that counties currently don't possess. Uh, and as Representative Canales pointed out, um, right now, 97, 98% of all of our transportation dollars are going to highways, roadways. But I've recently had a focus on rural areas and their uh, transportation challenges. And as you know, uh, what we're trying to achieve in uh, our nation is more rural resiliency. And we have in rural areas many, many millions of people that can't get to jobs because they don't have transportation. Uh, and many of those areas are surrounding large urban areas like uh, like Houston, for example. I, I note that we've got Alan Clark and Tom Jason uh, from Houston Metro, and we've talked about expanding uh, their transit to become a truly regional transit system, but there are gaps. Uh, with this tool, counties can actually create 
projects that will fill those gaps mm -hmm. through using uh, TRIS financing uh, because we don't have options right now uh, for uh, raising sales tax. As you know, everybody's maxed out, I think. Uh, if there's any political subdivision in the state of Texas that isn't maxed out, I want to know where they are because we can figure out how they might use that extra quarter or half cent. But the Austin area has the same problem. Uh, if you take every urbanized area and its surrounding counties, this will be a tool that can be very useful. I'll give you another example that's not a non-transit example. Uh, rep, uh, stakeholders in Galveston have been talking about developing Pelican Island a large portion of which is uh, owned by the port of Houston into a major deep water port uh, that could greatly enhance uh, our ability to manage freight uh, and the transfer of freight. Uh, and uh, we've talked for years about how we might uh, maximize the increase in value that could occur from infrastructure that connects Pelican Island uh, to the mainland by rail and things of that nature. So that's a, a potential port project that uh, could be considered by Galveston County with this tool. And so it isn't just highways. Right. It's the whole system of how we move people, goods, and services throughout the state. Uh, and um, so I'm excited about this. I think it will pass overwhelmingly uh, because it doesn't raise taxes. It just gives counties, you know, for for decades, I've heard about unfunded mandates coming down to, to our counties and cities from federal and state regulation. This is a uh, this is a tool that enables uh, counties to work with, and I and I view it as a development tool. Many developers developers who have significant uh, projects for development uh, can now go to counties and suggest that you know they will be willing to uh, have their projects come under this particular tax uh, that can develop some of the infrastructure they need to make their projects more viable. So I think it's a terrific tool all the way around. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for that. Um, I did see there's a great question. Um, Virginia with uh, Houston Public Works. Um, are you still on? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Can you ask your question? Because it was a great question. Uh, yeah, my question is, is blight defined within the proposition? And if so, how? Um, and then can an area be designated as blighted with flexibility um, by the county? So I don't know, Dylan, are you, sh I, I don't have it in front of me, but I don't believe the word, the term blighted is defined in the proposition. But um, in all matters uh, relative, um, if it became an issue, we could always come back and do it. But Dylan, are you aware that that's defined? I don't think so. I don't think it's defined. No. It, it's uh, the underdeveloped, underutilized land is the general sort of description that you would expect. Uh, that you find that in in all of the other uh, uh, reinvestment zone tax increment tools that exist for cities. Uh, and I think that that then provides a, the ability for a debate to take place at the county commissioner's level as right. to whether indeed, you know, that area is blighted or will be uh, redeveloped if a certain roadway or other infrastructure is funded through this mechanism. And that's why local control is, is critical. So let, me, let me add to that real briefly, because this is one of the questions that we've gotten from many of the editorial boards is, uh, don't you think this is right for abuse, et cetera, and, or if it's not a blighted area or, and, and, and Barry highlighted it perfect, is that it's a local issue. And I promise you that local politics will give you your term limit if you're messing around. And so, um, you know, if it's because it's grounded in local politics, it's grounded at home, um, you're going to be held accountable to the voters when that debate happens in the commissioner's court uh, as to what you did and how you use this tool. Um, just like everything, uh, there's nothing in this world that's foolproof, and there's no, there's no, there's you can find a way to to get around or, or, or abuse anything. But the reality is, when you have to have an open debate and the discourse is open in the commissioner's court, and then you're held to highest standard, which is an elected official when. 
you have to be at the ballot box. Um, I, th- I think that, that that in and of itself uh, is the biggest guardrail that we've got for most often uh, anything that we're doing at the local level. Absolutely. Thank you, Virginia. That's a great question. And I, I got a similar question too. I think uh, Chronicle called kind of piggybacking on uh, the editorial conversation and the, this, the I gleaned from the conversation that they are, it looks like they will be supporting the proposition, uh, but they were definitely kind of digging into some of those, uh, some of those details. Um, any other questions um, before we, um, I know our chairman wants to, to, to say a few things to kind of a call to action for our members. Well, uh, I'm, I'm gonna let you take over. Yeah, well, look, I mean, in an, in an era where TAG has uh, advocated against, you know, various caps that have come uh, that prevent local government from investing in itself, this is a tool that is going in the other direction. And we need this tool. Uh, and can this be tool misuse? Absolutely. And then will local voters hold people accountable and will we be uh, leading that charge? Absolutely. Uh, and so I think that this is kind of an important conversation to have, um, but for the development of, of Harris County, this is critical and, and we, we want to see it in this region. Uh, I want to, uh, one, thank the, the chairman uh, and Vice Chairman Thompson for their leadership in, in, in passing this legislation. You have done the heavy lifting. The purpose of this call was to ask each of you as, as leaders to help us um, reach out to your employee base, your friends, your, your families. This is not going to pass by itself. Uh, you know, there's a lot of voter apathy. People aren't really thinking about this election. Uh, and so we're going to have to, you know, send out emails, use your social media. It's going to be putting uh, things in social media that should be shared. Uh, people need to be asked to go vote. Uh, and, and you will need to do the asking. <laughs> you will need to tell people that this is important uh, and, that, and that you would be grateful if they went out and voted and asked their families to vote. Uh, this is, uh, if you looked at the east end of Harris County where we've got the Port of Houston and others, Charles Canales put it really well. We are paying uh, for the damage for the infrastructure so people in other parts of the state can have cheaper goods and services. This is exactly what, what's happening. And we need to find some tools so that our roads aren't basically uh, dilapidated over, over the decades uh, because other people find cheap trucking solutions, right? I mean, and, and so I, I'm, I'm frustrated when I drive. Uh, I drive a, a, a vehicle with big wheels and I still get flats. <laughs> and I think that uh, a lot of Houstonians and, and people in this region feel the exact same way. And so anytime we can get we can get something like this, it's it's obligatory on all of us to do our part. And I'm grateful for uh, the chairman and the vice chairman and the committee uh, and all of the members that have done their part. And now it's our, our turn to do our part. So with that, Andrea, thank you for, as always, convening us and, and putting together this forum. I want to thank all the members and the leaders that are on this call. Uh, and there's a lot of staff here. Uh, uh, at the county level, uh, you know, if you need help, there are a number of experts here that will help. We will try to facilitate more of these types of conversations uh, uh, from TAG, uh, but this, is, this will require each of us to take individual responsibility and work our circles to have this happen. Andrea, is there anything that I'm missing about, about our upcoming events? Well, uh, just a reminder that we do have the state of TxDOT next Thursday. Um, which is going to be a great uh, conversation with uh, Commissioner Laura Ryan and District Engineer Eliza Paul, moderated by uh, Craig Rayborn. And I think, I don't know if he's still on, but um, I think he was on today as well, our uh, not so new, but kind of new MPO director, um, new, you know, with, with COVID, a year of COVID. So, um, so I just want to thank uh, Chairman Canales again, um, I had an opportunity to sit and listen to he and Chairman Nichols, I guess a few weeks ago now. And um, to say that they've worked hard is just such an understatement. Um, and, and the way that this was worked through the session. And I mean, his comment about the supermajority is, it is it's nothing short of a miracle. So, um, and that makes our job easier, quite frankly, when you have that much support kind of out of the gate from elected officials. Um, and so we, we will make sure that we do our part uh, to make sure our local officials are, are educated on this issue as well. Andrea, can I briefly say something? Cause I, I yeah, mentioned it to absolutely. the, to the, 
the Chronicle um, was that um, Miss Hall had done a, a brilliant job of isolating that I was the only person that was involved in it and, and leaving out Chairman Nichols. And because she doesn't want it to seem bipartisan, she wants it to look like it's a Democrat that's raising taxes on people. And it's important that people know that this is a bipartisan, I mean, really bipartisan bill uh, that was supported by uh, the the far left and the far right all the way around to the to the center of the aisle. And so uh, but her opinion editorial uh, that she's been try she's been moving across the state of Texas with uh, and she's had moderate success of, of getting it printed. But I will tell you that it, it, it jumped off the page. And she didn't mention that a Republican is who carried it in the Senate. And I think that that's important to let people know this is a bipartisan effort. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, that's we definitely want to curb any conversations that we're having with colleagues and family and friends and uh, any conversation like that that take that goes in that direction. We need to have we need to have the proper information to educate. And so we appreciate that. So thank you for reminding us about that. Um, so with that, um, I want to close out the conversation. Thank everybody for their time this morning. Uh, a reminder that TAG will continue to place um, all kinds of information all across our social media platforms. Um, we've got some paid ads, the video that you saw in the beginning. Um, we'll be running, we're running that on, on Facebook and all of our social media platforms. I also will be sending out a blast that you can just forward and share uh, with your colleagues. Um, and then for those that are on the call that are officials, local staff, um, again, reach out to me. Um, we'll be organizing a, a conversation to talk about, I'm going to say when this passes, <laughs> what that means for our county commissioners. Um, because once we get it passed, we don't want it to just sit there. We want to be able to use that tool. And so we want to make sure that our, um, our local leaders are properly educated and they know how to use this um, to, to make sure that we get the projects moving that need to get moving in, in our counties. So with that, thank you again so much. Chairman Canales, always a pleasure. Dylan, thank you so much as well. Um, Y'all are a treasure. And thank you also Vice Chairman Thompson for, for being here. You're always on and getting informed. And even though you know everything already, you're still here. <laughs> and we appreciate that because that means that you're, a, you're an, it's why you're such a good leader. Um, cause you're always willing to listen and hear what others are asking. And so we really appreciate that. And we hope that y'all have a great week and, uh, we'll see you next week at the state of Tech Dot. So thanks everybody. Thanks. Take Bye. care.